Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us uh, for the Carbon Strat Strategy and Ag, Ag Tech session. Um, and so, Nick, um, I thought you could just get us started with telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey to be CEO of Habitare. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation here today. Uh, I'll try and make this as brief as possible, but I get excited sometimes. So, uh, Nick Renke, uh, my entire life and career have really been in agriculture. So I come from a family farm in North Dakota. Uh, my brother's still taking over the farm back there. I get back and help out with harvest. So corn, soybeans, wheat, beef cattle, kind of all the things there. Uh, I spent about 10 years in crop insurance and ag banking. So really loved working together with farmers across the upper Midwest, kind of understanding how they made decisions. Uh, that was frustrating occasionally. Um, but it was really great to get to understand how I could support farmers. But that really led me down this path of thinking about where's the future of agriculture headed? What are the things that these farmers are going to face in our generation? And climate change is impossible to ignore in that part of the conversation. So what I saw in the climate change and ag tech space is I just didn't see any, any real authentic agricultural voices in that conversation. So that's why I decided to make a career pivot into the sustainability space. I uh, actually ended up out in Baltimore to get my MBA at Johns Hopkins. While I was there, I got to work with smallholder farmers in India and see some of the challenges that they face. Uh, but I came back here and looked at where I could get engaged in this kind of conversation at a system scale. So that led me to Truterra, the sustainability business at Lando Lakes. So Truterra was kind of a startup within this massive cooperative system. And while I was there, I uh, kind of worked across the ag value chain, launched a carbon market. So you think about going from being a farm boy in North Dakota to getting farmers paid by Microsoft to store carbon in their soil. Uh, it was just kind of mind blowing to see these new market mechanisms. But finally getting to the point of how I ended up at Habitare, um, Launching that market of Truterra, we saw that it was really dependent upon manual data gathering from farmers, not scalable, as everybody in this room probably knows. On top of that, quantifying agricultural environmental outcomes, really, really difficult to do at any meaningful scale and to do so with scientific credibility. So when we looked at remote sensing and technological solutions there at Truterra, they left a lot to be desired, to be frank. And uh, then I met Dr. Caillou Guan from the University of Illinois here at Urbana-Champaign. And what I saw with Caillou's technology is he, he built some real technology that could actually solve some of these major issues. So looking at environmental outcomes at a field scale, but also greatly reducing the data burden on farmers to engage with these emerging environmental markets. So I joined the team about a year ago uh, as Caillou was kind of scaling up the business of Habitat, and it's, it's been a lot of fun ever since. Okay, thank you. And so for, for people in the room that don't know what Habitare is, maybe you could just tell us what is Habitare and what's its carbon solution strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Habitare is a technology company that really focuses on, as I mentioned, quantifying agricultural and environmental outcomes, but also looking at ag productivity. So. I'll try and kind of hit that right balance of I'm sure some in this room are pretty familiar with these carbon markets and some maybe not so much. So what I'll say is most of the solutions to quantify environmental outcomes in ag, they're focused very, very intensely on the soil. So the modeling is looking at the soil, measurements looking at the soil, measuring soil carbon is extremely difficult to do, especially to do accurately or on a recent, you know, on a decent time scale. Other, you're typically looking at five to 10 years to be able to detect a soil carbon change in terms of absolute carbon stock values. So the technology developed at Habitat, we're able to accurately estimate year to year soil carbon flux, but we're also looking at nitrous oxide emissions, nutrient loss pathways, so we're thinking about productivity efficiency and where those nutrients go into waterways and things like that. So it's a much more holistic look at this carbon picture. So rather than just focusing on soil carbon, we're actually looking at the farm production system. And we think about adoption in agriculture, that's the key. We need to think about not just maximizing soil carbon, but let's do it in the context of overall agricultural productivity as well to recognize, you know, when farmers change practices, there's a chance of a yield penalty that goes along with that. And we need to think about it from that farmer lens to say, you know, there's real risk for them to participate in these carbon markets. So let's, let's think about the production system, not just soil carbon. So that's really the core of our, our solution. And so what are the technologies that have really brought this to bear and made this possible? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk about the promise of things like remote sensing in agriculture. There's certain things that remote sensing does pretty well, and there are a lot of things that it maybe doesn't do so well, right? Um, and same goes for modeling. When we think about models to replicate plant growth processes and soil processes, there are certain things that they do pretty well and other things that they maybe don't do so well. So the key evolution of the technology that uh, happened right here at the University of Illinois in Caillou's lab was looking at those things that, what does remote sensing do really well? What does modeling do really well? And how can we intelligently marry these two things together? So I mentioned earlier, soil carbon models, again, very focused on soil carbon. What Caillou did is he, he looked at these models that are also looking at things like above ground biomass and productivity and estimating what actually happened above the ground, not just below the ground. And by doing that with the model, now we have this model that's actually looking at soil carbon input photosynthesis. That's your only real input of carbon into the system. So if you look at photosynthesis in, you look at yield out, uh, you can really accurately estimate plant respiration, soil respiration, and ultimately your remainder is soil carbon. So the key advance in the technology here, we're not trying to measure absolute carbon at two different points in time, which is incredibly difficult, as I said, to do accurately. What we're doing is looking at net carbon flux on an annual basis. So we can accurately estimate what's coming into the system, what's leaving the system, and therefore estimate what carbon is staying in the system. So. Some of its advances to the remote sensing technology. So uh, really all of our technologies are licensed from, from the lab here. Uh, one of the key pieces of IP is a satellite fusion algorithm. So that takes publicly available satellite data, fuses it together in a way that you can get cloud-free, gap-free imagery. And then another cool thing that the lab did was tied together that satellite imagery with ground truth imagery. So now we're using ground truth images paired with airborne hyperspectral imagery at kind of that middle scale and then tying that up to satellite imagery. So even though the satellite imagery might be lower resolution, by training those models with millions and millions of data points, now we can make that satellite see more than you would think it would be able to because of that training. And then ultimately we fuse that data together with the biogeochemical model that's replicating the plant growth process. And now you've got not just inputs to the model, but constraints that continuously tie the model back to what's happening in the real world, and that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to accomplish. I think one of the key challenges that was discussed this morning in the sustainability session is variability. So there's environmental, environmental variability that plagues agriculture, there's temporal variability, there's variability in practices. Um, and so how does this approach sort of get over that, that challenge and that hurdle? Yeah, I, I love that question. I love that that came up in that conversation because that's one of the things that's poorly understood by the people that are creating these markets. Um, so this is where I kind of mentioned, you know, I want to see those authentic ag voices that can represent some of that variability because when a carbon market's trying to generate carbon credits, what they want is a nice clean binary to justify that carbon credit. So they want to say, here was the practice that was in place before, <laughs> business as usual case, and now here's the switch that happened to create the carbon credit. So farmer wasn't using cover crops, now they're using cover crops so we can pay them for carbon credits generated, right? But to your point of variability, how many farmers do we know in here that do the same thing every single year regardless of what the weather and cropping conditions are, right? It's highly variable. So more often than not, you've got a cover crop one year, the next year maybe the timing doesn't work out or it doesn't fit with the rotation. So you don't have that clean binary that the market's looking for. So what can happen to address that is, you know, for us, rather than kind of taking that high level view of what's happening across a landscape or trying to shoehorn highly variable practices into that false binary that we're talking about, we start everything at the field scale. So we're looking at what that farmer actually did in that actual field and then we can aggregate that up at scale. But because we can look at each individual field, now we can get a lot more nuanced in saying, you know, what actually happened in that field? What were their weather conditions, soil conditions? How was that field managed? What was the timing of those practices? And now we can have a lot more thoughtful conversation on what progress have we made with these practice changes rather than trying to uh, fit farmers into a few 
prescriptive boxes. Right. I mean, I think the National Agricultural Statistics Service that the USDA has would argue that some of some of what they've done in the past, right? They have they have boots in the field, right? That do yield predictions and look at the field, and they've collected hundreds of years of data. So you can say, okay, this year is just like 1979, and so therefore, you know, this is what we expect. And so, um, you know, how does this advance that really basic sort of approach to understanding and being able to be predictive when, when you know, we can't know the weather in advance for any growing season? Yeah. Um, I'll take that kind of two different ways. So one is sort of the monitoring and seeing how it actually went. And then the other side is, like you say, being prescriptive, which are being, uh, you know, putting the forecast out there, which is a very, very different animal. Um, so a big thing that I think gets lost in these conversations is when we propose advanced technologies like ours, they often feel like an either or kind of proposition. So you've got that great boots on the ground resource, massive resources by whether it's NAS, NRCS, you know, you, you have these boots on the ground resources that you absolutely need. Um, but also with technologies like ours, it's kind of a yes and where, you know, we can use that ground truthing data that they develop that's wonderfully useful. However, we can make those efforts go farther. So either you scale in a linear fashion where you just more boots on the ground, gets you that incremental gain, or you give them tools like ours to extrapolate those insights and say, okay, yeah, maybe this is like 1979. However, maybe we had slight differentiation in rainfall in that very specific area that resulted in planting being a few weeks later. And now all of a sudden, it might be like that year nationally, but locally, regionally, and down to a field scale, probably going to be very different. And that's true even of things like another cool technology. Sorry, I'll keep shouting at the university because uh, that's, we're here. that's what it's <laughs> exciting about the tech. Um, but another cool aspect is we're looking at like daily time step photosynthetic productivity, right? And that's going to vary just by daily cloud cover. And that's going to change your outcomes in terms of not just emission, but ultimately productivity. So every year is going to be a little bit different. And that's the kind of nuance that we can capture with the scalable observational and modeling suite that no number of boots on the ground is, is going to be able to fully capture. OK, thanks. Um, I think we'll invite the panel. And so uh, Dennis Beard, who's the managing partner with Sarah Ventures, um, and Ross Brinkelmeyer, the Ecosystem Service Technology Strategy Lead at Bayer. Could you come join us? Good morning. Well, Ross, you're seated. So maybe we'll get started with you. And I was hoping you could give us some historical spec perspective about carbon credits and how the moment that we're in now compares to the efforts in the early 2000s with the Chicago Climate Exchange. Well, thanks, Lisa. And uh, thanks to uh, everyone for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to, uh, to you all today. Um, you know, it, I, I love this question uh, for a lot of different reasons. One. One is that a lot of folks that I talk to in the carbon space, they don't even realize that there was a carbon credit market 20 years ago. Uh, the Chicago Climate Exchange was a pilot market uh, that, was, that was launched uh, in order to learn about what would it take to have a carbon credit market. Uh, everything from incentivizing growers, measuring carbon change, monitoring that practices were adopted, verifying that, that the carbon was, was changed, the practices were done. That was uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, I, I was just coming out of my master's degree and found myself uh, working with growers in, in Montana and, and, and having conversations about how, how might this work? How could growers you know, earn revenue? Uh, from changing practices that, uh, for uh, a lot of intents and purposes, are, are, are better for sustainability and, and uh, yield resilience uh, in general, like no-till. Um, you know, when, I, when Bear launched the, their carbon business two years ago and I got plugged into it, um, I started learning about some of the things that they were learning about um, and well, what are some of the challenges around bringing a, a certifiable credit to market. Uh, and they were talking about concepts like additionality and permanence um, that 
you know, additionality being if, if you, if in the absence of the project that the practice wouldn't be adopted, and permanence, how long does carbon need to be in the store, soil and, and so forth. And I'm, I remember thinking, man, I don't know whether I should laugh or, or cry because we talked about this 20 years ago. Are we really not any further along? But, but then looking back, we've actually made a lot of strides uh, in the last 20 years around the science of carbon, understanding the mechanisms that, that carbon, uh, how carbon is uh, stored in soil. Um, we have new models and, and ways of measuring, reporting, and verifying carbon change uh, in, in the soil. Um, and uh, you know, we also learned a lot from that, uh, that, that experiment of the Chicago Climate Exchange around the value of trust and transparency in generating a carbon credit. How real is it? And today, there are organizations, uh, there are several of them out there, with names like VERA, Gold Standard, Climate Action Reserve, so-called carbon registries. And they're the ones that are setting the protocols, the rules, to help ensure that the, the projects that are being brought to the market today are science-based, they are certifiable, uh, and that the credits are real. Thank you. Um, Dennis, maybe you could tell us about some of the investments just that, that um, Sarah Ventures is making in startups that are involved in carbon solutions today. Uh, okay, uh, sure. So I'm Dennis Beard. First of all, what a great turnout. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm just knocked out at how big and how successful this event has grown to be over the years. It's delightful to be here. So if, if you don't know about Sarah Ventures, we're headquartered in Champaign with offices in Chicago and, and the West Coast. Uh, we have four managing partners, um, and two, two of my partners are here, Tim and Rob are over there on the side. Tim's our CEO and founder. Um, and if, if you don't know much about venture capital, a, a better way maybe to describe what we do, we are ma matching organizations and people that want to invest in ag and food technology to companies that are building new technologies in ag and food. And uh, we use mechanisms like limited partnerships and we help manage that process. So it's a, we're the, 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 the conduit, if you will, to match money to these interesting new things that are popping up. And a little over two years ago, Sarah launched this um, Sarah Capital Ag Fund, um, Ag Tech Fund, really um, nudged by a couple of our investors in our previous general technology funds who really wanted to focus in this area. So we launched it a little more than two years ago. We've got about 20 companies in the portfolio right now. We're looking for a few more companies to fill out that portfolio. It's about $45 million. And uh, we're, we're just delighted on how it's going. But if you look back, we have been doing investing more broadly, starting right here at the U of I uh, Research Park. And some of our previous investments were in ag as well. So I, I would be remiss in not mentioning one of our early investments, which many of you are familiar with, that came out of the research park called Agrable. And uh, Agrable, as it turned out, uh, a key part of their data platform was tracking sustainability and traceability for crops, several different crops. And um, we had another company called 640 Labs that turned out to be pretty successful, and they provided data on the farm operation. So anyway, we, ha we had a little bit of a track record, and when we formed this fund, we identified some areas that we thought, um, uh, it mentioned earlier, some of this is very consumer driven. Consumers are, are demanding uh, sustainability in the products they buy. Uh, they're demanding uh, uh, healthy, they're demanding traceability. And uh, some of those aspects uh, uh, fall into uh, practically every investment we're making right now. And, um, you know, we, I, I don't think we've invested anything, maybe a couple of really close that were specifically about carbon capture or carbon credits, but we've had some interesting uh, uh, companies, that I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. I made a couple of notes. One of the early investments we made is a company called Drone Seed, which is doing reforestation primarily out west. And so uh, they actually bought a seed company to, to uh, help uh, replant forests after forest fires. And part of their methods allow the owners of the land to capture ex ante carbon credits from this reforestation. It's pretty fascinating. So they've been, they've been able to market some of that and they're off to a really interesting start. One of the companies that I'm uh, very familiar with and working on uh, 
every week is out of Kansas City. It's called Vitelli, and they're working on low carbon beef and dairy, and uh, primarily through a combination of genetics, genomics, and and measurement technologies that they've developed, and uh, they're they're getting some recognition for the progress that they're making. Uh, we've got Ag Tools. I was just talking to Martha Montoya. She's sitting over there somewhere. Ag Tools measurement for a bunch of different high value crops and fruits and nuts and things like that worldwide. And that's helping companies make better buying decisions and being more efficient and uh, more efficient in their logistics. So once again, not a direct carbon play right there, but the information. All right, thanks. So this is sort of a, a broad um, um, range of topics in the space of carbon strategies. And, and the sustainability panel also mentioned this morning the need for coalescence of sort of university researchers and companies and I would say investments around the right hypotheses and the right questions for sustainability. And I'm just wondering what are the right questions for carbon strategies that we need to coalesce around and, and do we know what those are? So that's kind of open, and anybody can take that one. <laughs> Maybe, Ross, you work for the big company, so yeah. you can tell us what they're doing. Oh, so what do we need to be doing to coalesce around? Wow, so that, um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things going on in this space. Um, so, so again, kind of tying back to what we learned from the, the early experience, right? So what... Measuring, reporting, and verifying is a, is a key component to the success of a carbon market. Um, whether it's direct measurement, which uh, everyone in this room would agree that going out and poking a bunch of holes in millions of acres of farmland is not scalable or sustainable. Um, but there's new technologies that are out there. Uh, whether it's a proximal sensor that you can go and poke a hole in the ground and measure carbon right now, something you can drive across the ground, um, some remote sensing uh, solutions, technologies like modeling that, that, that Nick is working on with Habitair. In terms of coalescing, what, one of the things that I think needs to happen is, is really to influence a lot of these carbon registries to be more open to these new technologies to make this happen. Um, they're moving in the right direction, uh, although, um, albeit uh, conservatively. But if we can, you know, between the, the investing in, in new technologies and, and getting them to a point where they're accurate, scalable uh, through, uh, through venture capital, as well as uh, the science the, uh, of new startups that are that's going on there and, and partnering with um, you know, several you know, companies like Bayer and others who have these large carbon projects that are working directly with the registries and influencing them to be more uh, flexible about the technologies as well as, yeah, you're right, you know, practice adoption or not practice adoption. Um, even if you have variability within that, there's still going to be benefit from a, from a sustainability, a greenhouse gas space. Yeah, uh, well said, Ross. Um, and maybe to build off that a little bit, you know, like you say, that uh, that advocacy is a huge piece. And for us as a smaller startup, we don't have the funding to throw a bunch of money after you know, PR campaigns. And even if we did, there's a clear bias in the kind of message that we're trying to carry, right? So there's gonna be a bias in favor of our technology being the right way, obviously. Um, so that's where I think some really, really cool things can happen with the advocacy around the science, you know, what do we really see in in the science? Because one of the things that we have a hard time messaging is when we get out there and we're competing with other entities in this space, uh, you know, Caillou in the lab here, they took the time to really build deep, rigorous bodies of research and actually went out and ground truth this, but, you know, in, in the startup space, if you're talking to non-technical people, and even when you are talking to technical people that don't have the time to review all the research, it gets pretty hard to decipher between a really shiny pitch deck and actual science and technology. Um, so that's, that's a place where, first off, really credit to the innovation ecosystem here at the university where, you know, it, to me it's that, it's that perfect ma marriage of applied science and actually getting that applied science out into the field. So the ability to do extensive ground truthing research on the university side, but then to have a good relationship with technology licensing to see that that research gets deployed 
but to your point on advocacy with these regulatory bodies, that's another place where the private market has a voice, but it's a little bit limited. You need that kind of third party source of truth and credibility that can be a little bit independent of commercial motives, similar to the registries to say, actually, here's the way that we should be looking at carbon gains in agriculture, and here's why it's different than those registry applications from forestry or, or other things. So that's an opportunity that I, I agree with you. I see that on the university side to be potentially more, uh, more vocal in terms of advocacy for the latest and best science and how that supports some of the outcomes and, and technological advances that we see. I would just add, Nick, I agree, uh, uh, some of our companies, uh, as private companies and small companies with limited resources, can only go so far, but uh, I see some of them being pretty active in participating in standard setting and, and working with the people that are trying to establish what the baselines are. Um, just another thought that occurred to me, uh, and um, you know, maybe maybe Rob and some of the other guys in our firm were thinking more explicitly about this from the beginning, but we're also uh, seeing investments in things that really aren't focused on on making a profit or uh, or getting specific measurements from um, say carbon credits and, and carbon uh, 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 efficiency, but nonetheless we know they're having an impact and we think that's appealing. Uh, on multiple fronts. Uh, for example, one company we made an investment in is called Veritas Substrates, and they make substrates for planting in greenhouses and also in the field for berries and, and a lot of different fruits and plants. And um, I didn't realize this until we were looking at that company, but uh, um, peat is a huge release of carbon into the environment, and, and uh, now it's becoming uh, not very nice to be harvesting that peat and releasing all that carbon. So these are low carbon methods that come back in. They don't anticipate generating credits necessarily at this point, but they're doing a great thing for the environment, and we think it's a wise investment and will sell well with, with growers around the world. Right, so I guess in terms of a broad carbon strategy um, in ag tech, that is more than just carbon credits. Um, and, and I think, but I think that the top of mind for a lot of people are carbon credits and scalable carbon credits, and, and where do we go after no-till and cover crops? What's next? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there there are some exciting emerging technologies that actually get back to points that Ross made um, and some of the struggles that we see in carbon credit markets where they're looking for those things like additionality and permanence. I mean, both of those are a little bit difficult in these highly variable systems that we're talking about and we recognize carbon is constantly in flux in the soil. You know, just by the very nature of it, that carbon that's going into the soil isn't particularly permanent. So a few technologies that are out there that I'm kind of excited about are things like rock weathering. So now you can use this rock as a soil amendment. The chemical process secures that carbon very long term, so it really satisfies both the additionality and permanence side of the market. Uh, but it can also be a really beneficial soil amendment. It has some pH impacts and things like that that can make it a pretty interesting soil amendment. Uh, and biochar is another one. Uh, I'll not claim to be any particular expert on that or how that scales up, but there are a few interesting things like that that I think are, are exciting on the fairly near-term horizon, but would love to hear your guys' thoughts too. Yeah, sure. You, uh, you, 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 you kind of hit the, the, the product space, right? So I think there's, I think there's a, a lot of a lot of new opportunities beyond no-till and, and, and covered crops. Uh, some is that product space, whether it's a, a biological or it's a, it's a, a, a new product like the, the rock weathering approach, biochar. Um, I also think that there's other opportunities uh, more directly related to production ag today uh, around water usage, water quality. Uh, so there's been some, some work around uh, water credits um, water quality credits. Uh, there is some early, there's an early project up in the Great Lakes area around phosphorus uh, and changing practices to be more, um, to reduce the impact of phosphorus loading in, in, in the Great Lakes. So there's opportunities, uh, I think, in, in some of the other nutrients. Um, nitrogen is another big one. Uh, we heard earlier nitrous oxide is a, is a big component of production agriculture. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more powerful of a, of a greenhouse gas. So small changes in, in, in nitrogen could have a big impact on, on, um, on sustainability and, and the greenhouse gas uh, budget. I don't have anything to add to that. Dennis? So 
Um, maybe Dennis, I can ask you this one. Are there investments in rethinking the agricultural system that you're making? So, you know, we're kind of talking about changing um, practices for, for row crop agriculture. Are we looking at investing in, in changing the system? In changing the system, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, thinking of a couple of investments we've recently made that uh, deal with robotics in, on the farm. Uh, labor saving, fuel saving devices, more efficient. Uh, we also have a, a, a company over in Indiana called uh, Smart Apply. That's their product uh, name, I think, and, and they're an efficient sprayer. So they're using uh, the latest in technologies to uh, minimize uh, whatever you're spraying on the crops, and that includes trees and nuts and grapes and all kinds of things like that. And um, you know, the, uh, uh, maybe unrelated to carbon in a sense uh, today, although you, you can start to imagine some benefits from it, there's a huge labor shortage in agriculture right now, which is driving a lot of change. So we're seeing um, uh, information technologies and also mechanization uh, using robotics that are helping to replace some of that labor in the field. And that's, that's something we're tuned into. We see uh, such a wide breadth of, of opportunities and trying to tune in on how it can solve some of these great big, big problems of sustainability or labor shortages or food safety and traceability, those kinds of things always gets our attention. And so in, in thinking broadly about some of the technologies that you've mentioned, I, I just want to ask um, who you think are the beneficiaries of this technology? So maybe both directly and indirectly. So you know when you're marketing these or when you're um, thinking about your your market, who are the beneficiaries? Um, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think um, a lot of these products wouldn't fly if they don't benefit the growers. If it's a if it's a grower product. Um, but that has to translate to buyers and providers uh, of, of, uh, of the products and services up and down the chain. It, it, it might work if it just helped the grower maybe save a little bit of money, but it might not have the kind of impact, it might be easily replicatable. So, um, I mean, just to think a little bit about uh, the, the smart apply spraying technology, um, that's going to be very beneficial to the environment if we can spray fewer pesticides, uh, fewer chemicals, um, but also could be a time saver and a cost saver for the grower as well. And uh, it just makes for a more efficient farm and, and probably a better product out, uh, crop output. And that's just one of, I mean, I could go down the list of all 20 companies and probably come up with some examples on every one of them, but you don't really want to hear that. Nick, who, is your, who do you think of? Is this a, are farmers your customers? Yeah, um, you know, customers versus beneficiaries is an right. interesting question, right? Uh, and there's part of me that can't help but just take a moment, get a little starry-eyed and say, well, we're helping the planet, we're helping humanity, we're making agriculture more resilient to a changing climate, all of these dreams and promises of these environmental marketplaces. And, you know, I say that a little bit facetiously in this moment, but the truth is, there's a real opportunity that if we get these markets right, that if we create this new market mechanism around incentivizing better stewardship of our resources, it really does have that level of implication. And if we get it wrong, um, we all know what it's like to get something wrong with farmers. You don't lose them for a year, uh, you lose them for a generation, right? And I think that's the promise and the risk of what's happening in these markets. And to you know, Ross's point, it, it's not just carbon. Um, these practices are great for farm resilience and water retention. They're also great to limit that nutrient loss to the waterways. So now we're talking about watershed impacts, water quality impacts, both in terms of drinking water and things like the hypoxic zone of the Gulf of Mexico and all that kind of stuff. Um, so forgive me my little soapbox rant there. Um, but that's what I'm most passionate about is trying to figure out, you know, let's get these markets right. And it really does have that kind of a system scale impact. But at the end of the day, we don't see farmers as being the customer who pays for our technology, nor should they be. Where there's an opportunity to capitalize on this market is you have this influx of capital from entities that have a motivation to make some sort of a climate claim, right? But in order for these markets to function, 
we need to help them reach farmers in a meaningful way that meets farmers where they're at, helps them engage with these markets, makes it not an additional burden, but purely an opportunity that's aligned with the best outcomes of the farm. So it doesn't need to be this parallel thing to farming practices. In its most ideal sense, it should be integrated with the system. So I think these carbon credit markets are great, but at the end of the day, if we do a really good job quantifying the outcomes in the context of what farmers care about, now we don't necessarily have to care about the market me mechanism. I don't care if it's carbon offset. I don't care if it's an attached claim that goes with the grain as it moves through the system, uh, water credits, whatever it might be. If we quantify it correctly and get the right technical and educational resources out there to farmers and our technology being one small piece of that, um, that's where I think we can really benefit the farmer and that's, that's the key to unlocking benefits to the whole system. Yeah, if I could just uh, add, add to that, um, I think what I'm, what I was hearing in both of those responses is really it, it's an ecosystem that will be need to be built around the the ecosystem services market. Uh, I think we we could we can think more broadly than just carbon market, right? Because yeah, carbon is what is uh, is the easy one, <laughs> something like that. So carbon is quantifiable, perhaps, but uh, you know some of the other co-benefits that come around that, uh, around changing practices are, are, are less quantifiable, like soil health and, and, and that sort of thing, right? But really what's, what it's going to take is going to take an ecosystem, a whole network of, of companies, companies like, um, like Bayer and other companies that are, are, have that direct connection to growers to make them aware, give them opportunities, tools, um, in order to get, uh, to get knowledgeable, help that transition into regen practices. Um, last August, Bear launched uh, our Foreground by Bear program, um, which is a, uh, a farmer-focused um, program platform that uh, that it helps. It delivers uh, tools, uh, knowledge transfer, um, discounts, um, opportunities for new revenue. Uh, through the Bear Carbon program, as well as connecting growers to uh, other ag value chain companies who are trying to advance their own sustainability um, uh, programs and, and, and goals. But then, like you said, you know, there's, there are tools like, like, your, like Habitair who bring a very important component to that that we need to, to link all these together. There's the, the, the growers, it's interesting, I was originally hired by Monsanto, a seeds and trade company, right? And Bayer continues to be a seeds and trade company. It's growers who are our customers. Well, now they're a provider of ecosystem services. So it, it's, an, it's an interesting switch to how you know, we need to think about the agricultural ecosystem in general. Okay, I think we need to open it up for questions. We have some online, so okay. I, you may recognize this asker, Lisa, from Anthony DeGrotto. Uh, when carbon is stored in the ground thanks to the implementation of new practices, which baseline do you use to know how much carbon was effectively stored thanks to the practice, how long is the carbon stored, and is the duration of storage taken into account in the value of the carbon credit? Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> I will let you take that one. <laughs> okay, there was like eight questions in that question, right? <clears throat> okay, so help me out. Keep me, keep me on. Okay, so, all right, practices adopted. Carbon starts to be stored. What is the baseline, right? So the baseline today is what was your practice beforehand? What is your 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 business as usual pre-practice, uh, pre-new practice adoption. So that's where you know, tools like the models that uh, are out there, the biogeochemical models are out there, they help you to predict what would that baseline be doing in the absence of the new product, uh, in, in the absence of the new project. Um, so then they also predict what, uh, what is carbon doing because of the new, uh, the new practices. It's the delta between the baseline and the, uh, and the new practice is what the registries look at for um, certifying carbon credits. All right, maybe we have some at the mics. Emily, do you want to go first? Yeah, I would, I would have built on. Um, but Ross, you know, Ross, you agree with the question when I'm done asking. I want to build on what you said about being a seeds and trades company and ask each of the panelists actually their thoughts on new crops um, for Lisa's question about rethinking the system. We're in Illinois. Widely adopted across parts of the uh, world, California is still a leading rice producer. 
I can help. <laughs> All right. So are you considering perennials and new crops like perennial rice in your carbon strategies? So the, the, the short answer is yes. The, the longer answer is more around we need to uh, be able to understand the, the benefits that the new crops will bring to soil carbon and greenhouse gas uh, emissions within the ag system. Um, we're super excited about new, new crops uh, like the ones you, you mentioned, whether they're you know, perennial or even uh, like cover crest is a new uh, you know, penny crest based um, winter seeded crop that uh, could be used for oil. Fantastic. Um, what we, for this to be uh, integrated into a carbon marketing strategy, uh, we need to really be able to understand what are those, the, the net geo, uh, greenhouse gas benefits or emissions, whether it's uh, from that, that production system. Are we reducing the overall footprint uh, in terms of how often you're, you make passes on the field, um, what are the inputs, that sort of thing. What is the carbon benefit uh, into the soil of those different crops? So that's, that's going to take some time. Um, I, I think that's actually uh, to kind of come back a little bit to some of the, some of the new technologies that, that we need uh, to really move this forward is a lot of the models and tools that are out there, are, they're calibrated and validated for certain combinations of agroclimatic zones, soils, crop rotations, management uh, practices. To, to move beyond that, you, you need the, the ground truth data in order to support that model and tool development. Um, there are areas in the world that, that we have a lot of that ground truth data. Uh, there are a lot of places in the world where we don't. So how can we accelerate getting that ground truth data and for the new crops, generating that data that shows as you change management practices and integrate them into the system, what is the overall greenhouse gas benefit? If I may just, yes, and uh, build on that just a tiny bit. So speaking from the side of technology, when we think about quantifying this, absolutely to the ground truth measurements. Um, and this is a place where advances in technology can shift that paradigm a little bit. So in the past, you, know, you come out with a new crop, and now we need to test this new crop in multiple different geographies. And if we want to track its impact to soil carbon, your only option is really to do it for five or 10 years to actually measure the impact that that crop has. And then obviously we have the variability that was discussed earlier, so pretty hard to actually um, incorporate that. But with modern technologies that can take a different approach to measuring things like soil carbon flux, now we can look at you know, what was the net flux of gases in that system? Can we do targeted studies that can get that data to market faster? So rather than waiting for the time scale to actually be able to physically measure the soil carbon, uh, that's one of the advances of the technology that was done here and underlying Habitat's work is looking at net greenhouse gas flux to the system and now we can start to estimate what was actually captured and that obviously you want to pair it with some soil sampling and that kind of thing but there are ways to incorporate these advances much more rapidly into advanced models versus using some of the models that are 30, 40 years old and dependent upon those kind of more classic practices. Thanks. Take the next question. Sure. So um, in terms of carbon sequestration and nitrogen, maybe also in terms, so science and technology is going to be key in terms of making, being successful with that, I think, um, and achieving the kinds of, uh, you know, uh, improvements in, car in, uh, in emissions and so on that we need. With all of the changes and all of the improve, you know, genetic engineering has really advanced in the last five five to ten years with things like CRISPR and other uh, other technologies that have have allowed for improvements in genetics and I'm wondering if you're aware of any startup companies or any uh, big companies that are utilizing genetic engineering to for microbial systems as well as maybe for plant um, systems to enhance the carbon and nitrogen se sequestration that could occur that would really really make some significant improvements and maybe even increase the nutritional value of the soil um, at the same time um, through that type of application. You know, that's a really fascinating question. Um, the, uh, 
I, I myself am, am, am not uh, aware of, of companies that are working on that. Um, that's a little beyond the, the, the scope of what I'm currently working on. Uh, now, that doesn't say that there aren't companies out there that are working on it. Uh, I would l love to learn more about that. Well, and certainly, so I, as I said before, I'm coming from the, from the pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical space. Genetic engineering today is making such significant strides um, using these new genetic engineering technologies, CRISPR in particular, that, you know, it seems to me there would be application for that technology in the agricultural space that could significantly improve um, the ability to, to capture carbon and nitrogen in soil and, and, and capture it in, in a beneficial nutritional way. Um. Being conscious of time and conscious of expertise or absolute lack thereof, I have talked to a few entities that are working on that. And I'll say a couple of the, a, there's great promise in it, but a couple of the big challenges that I've heard from these entities, uh, number one, it is back to that spatial variability and soil diversity. So you think about these diverse microbial ecosystems and they, they find their own balance, right? So if you create that product, that product might work great in field A and be absolutely killed off by the current population in field B. So that's really difficult. And then the other thing I've heard about some of these that have started to try to scale commercially is where they start to fall apart is moving from the lab to the application. So we're great in the lab, we're great in the soil. It gummed up my equipment, I'm not gonna use it, right? But they're, they're out there and I think there's exciting potential. I would add, we uh, have an investment in a company uh, based in San Diego called CRISPR QC and they are a set of tools and techniques to help the researchers move along on products like that. And what we've uh, uh, found out to our surprise recently from, with briefings from the company is they're doing more and more work in the ag field. And so we're kind of excited about that. That's an investment we made in an earlier, earlier fund, but um, it seems to be pretty relevant now in, in ag. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the right approach. Yeah. Picks and shovels instead of doing the actual gold mine ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can we get Wes's question next, or do you want to do one from the audience? I'm not going to interrupt Wes. Okay. Oh, well, I'll try to be fast, but uh, sort of a comment question. Uh, you mentioned what's beyond cover crops and uh, no-till, asked, Lisa asked that. Um, about five miles from here, there's a silvopasture goat dairy that we manage and run, and it's perennial, uh, diverse, biodiverse. Uh, I think it's doing a lot of good things for the environment <clears throat> and, uh, and for the animals we're raising and for the people who are eating our products. So I'm hoping, and it was all corn and bean ground before we started on it, and it's uh, converting now. So I hope the scope uh, extends further than row crop uh, management, and uh, perennial rice was mentioned. <clears throat> That's a step. But uh, we create a, we're creating highly diverse <clears throat> systems that are actually producing food uh, also. They're not just for looks or wildlife, although wildlife is benefiting from it. We had a herd of 20 deer out on our place uh, not long ago, and they were enjoying goat food as well as uh, wild stuff. So anyway, just wanted to throw that in. I think that's a great comment. So is there, is there space in carbon strategies for more integrated agriculture? Likewise? Yeah, so I see that, uh, I see integrated as, as, uh, as something that's coming in the future. Um, although now something more tangible today is, I, there was a project in um, Bayer's environmental science program. There was a, a product uh, that they uh, developed um, that would kill annual grasses in, in historically perennial systems out west, where like cheatgrass was a, a, a big problem, right? Uh, and, and so they were looking at it not only from a, a, a rangeland restoration, but perennial systems, they store carbon at a you know more permanently and and at a greater rate than than uh, annual grasses in particular, and so they were looking at uh, a a carbon credit uh, associated with remediating the the rangeland uh, from the annual grasses. So I I, I think there's opportunity there. Um, I just don't know exactly when that might might launch. Just a comment after working in California. 
anything that gets rid of cheat grass is a good thing. <laughs> We'll ask one last question, and thanks. We got a lot of great questions for this panel. Um, oh, I see Paul is up there. So, okay, we'll take one more. Sorry, this this panel had a lot of great questions, so I apologize to all of you who are waiting. Um, if measurement measuring the carbon credit, credits are awarded by benchmarking against current practices, does that mean that farmers who have been doing sustainable farming for 20, 30 years do not benefit from the carbon credit system? Any way to address this by policy or by retroactively paying those farmers for their years of work? All right, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, so always a good question. What about the early adopters, right? So now, one of the things that you know, we primarily talk today about the most commonly known sustainability asset that I like to call them is the carbon credit or the carbon offset, right? So you, you adopt a new practice, you store carbon, you get paid for that delta. There are other uh, sustainability assets that are being developed uh, in, in this space that would reward growers who have already adopted practices and continue those practices going forward. Um, I think we heard earlier a little bit about low carbon fuel sources. Uh, so that's, that's one potential where um, if a grower has already adopted no-till cover crop in a corn system, sorry about the perennial system, um, that continuing to do that, they may be incentivized to continue to do that through a low-carbon fuel source type of, type of program. Um, some of our value chain, uh, ag value chain companies are interested in, in sourcing or d perhaps developing low-carbon labels. And so there, that would not require you to start a brand new practice. You would be rewarded for uh, practices that you uh, have already adopted. So the carbon credit may not be for everyone, but there are sustainability assets that are being developed uh, today that will enable a, a much broader number of growers to be, uh, to be able to participate. OK, one more? Oh. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I don't mean to direct another question towards you, Ross, so this is for anybody, but it is related to the point you made about validation earlier. I'm really curious about um, in what ways do carbon registries de-risk in terms of certificate duplication? Um, more specifically, how is the carbon credit industry thinking about managing or avoiding duplicate certificates across registries? Well, not directed at me. I guess this is directed at me. <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, you know, the registries, by and large, have kind of developed their own protocols within each registry. What I've, what I've noticed over the last couple of years is that the registries have started to talk to one another, not, not, not only for problems or the issue that you, that you described about double counting, right? Uh, but also to be more alignment, uh, more alignment around how do you calculate uncertainty of a project? How do you address the uncertainty of, of documenting carbon credits, um, issues of our concept of permanence and, and additionality? So there, there are some, there is movement in that space. Um, I, I don't know that there's a, a, a great solution today, but I do know that they're working on that. Okay, well thank you all very much for your thoughts in the conversation about carbon strategies. Thank you.